All right, once again, good morning to everyone and a happy Father's Day to all the fathers. Uh, there's no need for us to have a word of prayer because the pastor already opened us up this morning, so we can kind of jump right into things. I don't know how far we're going to get. Um, but with Father's Day, uh, when I initially thought of Father's Day today, the first thing that came to mind is how we talk about the children of Israel. You know, they have many days of festivals on their calendar, and every time they have a festival, uh, we talk about this, what do they do? What's the first thing they do in the festival? We talk about this many times, guys. Every Jewish festival on the calendar, when they have a festival, what's the first thing they do? No guessers? The first thing they do is they rehearse it and tell you why you're doing it in the first place. Because history for them is always important. They never do anything without knowing why it is they're doing what it is they're doing. Such as in our culture, we have many festivals and holidays and things, and we celebrate them, but do we know the history that's behind it? For example, Father's Day. Typically, you ask, what is Father's Day, or how did it come to be? And we will say what? Let's just talk. What do we say about Father's Day? Typically, typically we'll say, it's Father's Day. It's a day in which we take the time to honor the fathers for being fathers to the children, which is true. And we mean by fathers to the children, because keep in mind, there are many fathers out there, right? But not all of them are fathers to the children. We're talking about those fathers who are fathers to the actual children themselves. But the bigger question is this. How did Father's Day come to be? Anybody have an idea? It's something that we celebrate year after year after year. But do we really know how it came to be? Anyone knows? You want to know how it came to be? All right. Somebody asked a question, how did it came to be? I'm glad you asked that question, Roger. How did it came to be? It came to be, actually, because of a young girl by the name of Sonora Dotson was at a church service, or her church service, and they were having Mother's Day. Okay? Now, we all know Mother's Day had been celebrated long before Father's Day came about. And to give you a little history on Mother's Day, Mother's Day primarily came about or really came to fruition, you know how? Mainly by businesses, commercialism. Now, of course, if we celebrate it for what it is, you're honoring the mothers, what's the true spirit behind it. But it was actual businesses that really pushed it through to make it an official day because they saw it as an opportunity to make money. You know, you're buying cards, you're buying flowers, you're doing dinners, you're doing gifts and so on. So that really caused it to go through. But at this particular time, I think it was like 1909, where Sonora Dodson was at church and they were honoring all the mothers and everybody was having a, a wonderful time as the story goes. And she looked at her father who had a big smile upon his face seeing everyone celebrating the mothers. But then she became sad. Not only because her mother had already passed, but her mother had passed and there was nothing in place to honor her fathers and the other fathers. Because of the fact, when her mother passed um, in her early age and the children were young, she had six siblings and the father raised all of them by himself. And she would talk about how he would put the dresses on them, comb their hair and get the boards ready and go out and so on. But there was nothing to recognize, as she said at that time, her father and then the other fathers. So she set out to bring about what's called Father's Day. It was in 1910 in Spokane, Washington, when that was the first state that officially celebrated Father's Day. No other state actually celebrated it. But it picked up after that. In other words, it gained more momentum. It wasn't an official day, but people still celebrated it. Now, as things picked up with this, you'll find protests came about. You want to know who protested it? The men. Men protested it because they said, wait a minute, we already got Mother's Day. We're buying all this stuff. Now we got Father's Day, and we got to buy all this stuff for ourselves anyway. So it's coming from us. Check the history out on that. A lot of men protested. There was a movement to not to have Father's Day, but here's what they wanted to do. Get rid of Mother's Day also. And they wanted to call it Parents' Day, where you just celebrate them as a whole. Well, that never came about, and I think it was... End up being in 62 years later, I think in 72, when Father's Day then became official. 
So the history of Father's Day, how it started was, it started because of a young girl whose mother had passed, but she wanted something to honor her father, and she pushed it through, and it came to pass. So that's how Father's Day came into that of being. But also this weekend, there's another day that's going on. That's tomorrow. And what is that? It's picking up steam over the last few years. Juneteenth. We all know the history of Juneteenth? Do we celebrate it? And for most of us recently, we just celebrated. But do people really know the history of it? I told you before how um, the other year I walked up on the showroom and one of our guys was up there. He didn't look like us. Okay. And uh, I heard him say these words. He said, then we know what day it is. I mean, what's this foolish mess they come up with now? I know what he was talking about. He turned and saw me. He thought he had seen a ghost. Not because I'm an intimidating person, but he was talking in negative sense. And my response was, oh, we knew what day it was. The issue is, your people, the slave owners, didn't want us to know what day it was. But yeah, we know it was June the 19th. Now, I said, if you need to do some information on it, I'll talk with you later about it. And I left out. Because, you know, the job, you got to be careful how you say things. Things would build up. Because I didn't like those comments he was making. But the history of Juneteenth, do we know it in detail? Mm-hmm. 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 Yep. You got it dead right. Well, I'm going to give you all somewhat of a lengthy history with it. I might have a few of my names mixed up because it's somewhat of a lot to cover, but I like to always explain it from a, a bigger point of view, you know, so you can really get it, you know, because when we speak about, you know, the slaves being set free, that's simple and it's done. But when you look at everything that goes behind it or came before it, you go, wow, that was some serious stuff. I always go back to the year of 1492, when a man by the name of Christopher Columbus, y'all read of him? Christopher Columbus, Columbus wanted to be or get involved with the spice trade which was making a lot of money at that time. I think India was one of the primary places where this was going on. But he needed financing for the journey. So he sought financing through the Spanish monarchy, which they had a king and queen at that time. The queen and king and queen financed this expedition. So you then find that Christopher Columbus sails across the Pacific, and he lands on this island, and basically it is the Bahamas is where he lands at. And the island, I believe, is, is, is kind of sounds something like, you know, Guantanamo Bay, but it was called Gahani or something like that. He changed that name to be El Salvador, which is interesting. You sail all the way across the ocean to where people are at, and you change the name of the island they live on. He changed the name to, once again, to San Salvador, and then he sailed to some of the other islands. We call it Cuba, but most Cubans don't say Cuba. They say Cuba. Then he went to what we call the Dominican Republic, and on the island, which is the same island, uh, the other half, to Haiti. And he wrote back to Spain and said the islands were heavily populated with people. So he didn't discover anything, you follow me? People already were there. He said, but we took it with no resistance. You see how the history is building? How you have a history of things going on? They said we took it with no resistance. He leaves there and goes to South America, tours places there, and took some people, as the history would tell us, back with him. But most history books say what he took with him was slaves and carried them back across the water. So as he carries these slaves back, people said that, well, when he landed here, he called the Indians Indians because he thought he was in India. I've always debated that because if you look at history, Christopher Columbus never set foot in what we call the United States of America. Where he landed there was Bahamas and then in South America, and then he left. But our history will tell us that he came here upon this place and he discovered America. What he did was, by going back, he ushered in the area of the Europeans coming across the Pacific to be here. So that's really the true history there. And the reason why I bring this all up is because, well, it's a term that has been hijacked in the last, I guess, year or so. And that term is called the woke 
movement. You've heard of that? The woke movement hijacked to the point that uh, mainly, let's say, Republicans, they'll tie it in with everything that they don't like. They said, this is part of woke, this is part of woke, and part of woke, and so on from there. But if you research woke, woke is a, we put on T-shirts, a black thing. And that's what it was. It started in the Civil War era, I'm mean, Civil War, Civil Rights Movement, in which we were, shall we say, awakened to things around us that people didn't want us to know. So in other words, we no longer sleep on these things. We recognize what's going on behind the scenes and what you are doing to it and our true history. So we are woke on these things. But now you'll find there's a movement to keep all these things hidden, such as what I just gave you about Christopher Columbus never being in America, but actually in South America is where he went. But you'll find that when he ushered in now, these people come across the, the, the water now. Uh, as they came here, I think the first slaves were, uh, you guys are starting, 1619, when the first slaves came on a Dutch ship, I think they might have landed in Norfolk, New News, and others came and landed into what we call that of Jamestown. And this country grew. More and more slaves were brought over. Free labor. We talked about this before. You take major companies. Roger, you were you with the bank, right? Now imagine how big as the bank is. And all these years, the bank been making money, but didn't have to pay anybody. Massive amount of wealth. So as they're building and, get, shall we say, getting more and more people, you'll find in, in I think it was 1775, when the Revolutionary War started, in 1776, July the 4th, is when we say that we now declare our independence, that we are now what? A free nation, and we hold these truths to be set on it. All men were pretty equal. But guess what? Millions of blacks were still what? They were slaves. They were still slaves. This is why, to this day, I do not celebrate the 4th of July. I understand it. I accept it because guess what? It's part of American history. But I do not celebrate it for what people say it means because people weren't free. This nation wasn't free because millions of our people are still in slavery. For me, it's part of our history. I recognize it. But guess what? It's a day off with pay while I get some hot dogs. That's how I celebrate it because it's not a true day. But see, they don't want you to be woke on these things. They want you to be asleep on them. But you'll find that at this time they declared independence, but there was no independence. You find as time goes on, you had then the, the War of 1812. You move beyond that. I think it was 1860, a Republican president by the name of Abraham Lincoln wrote what we call the Emancipation Proclamation. It was proposed in 1860. But you'll find as the Civil War breaks out in 1863, it now became official that guess what? All slaves were now free. But what slaves were actually free? Only those under Union control. Those of the Confederacy still was kept in slavery. But the interesting thing about the Emancipation Proclamation is that in January of 1863, the 13th Amendment was proposed. And that basically outlawed slavery in the United States. But it wasn't, shall we say, passed at this time or ratified. This is why Abraham Lincoln pushed the Emancipation Proclamation, which freed the slaves. But the thing about it is, is that all slaves, you know, uh, weren't free under the Confederacy. So to make them free, keep in mind, they didn't have cell phones, right? They didn't, couldn't text anybody. It was word of mouth and horse and carriage carrying the message forth. So as time goes on, you'll find that Abraham Lincoln had to send the military in to enforce this ruling. The southernmost state was that of Texas. This was two and a half years later. Some 87 years had passed since the um, Declaration of Independence had came about. But here you'll find now that he had sent the military in uh, to Galveston, Texas, a general by the name of Gordon Granger, went there with the soldiers and let them know that they now were free. And this day was June the 19th, of 1865, where we said we were free. I always put it this way, that started our freedom. Because really, with sharecropping and all the Jim Crow laws and all that stuff came along, we still weren't really a free people, but it started that particular movement. So it was June the 19th how this came about. So you see the history of slavery throughout. But here's the thing, when you're dealing with, um, when you're dealing with the, um, the slaves here, that really wasn't the official day. I'm throwing a curveball at you now. We said, I thought it was June 19th, all slaves were free. Technically, not really, but we celebrated. 
Here's why. I think it was two more states that were left, and I might have one of them wrong. I think it was Delaware and Kentucky didn't actually follow that law of the Emancipation Proclamation until six months later, December the 5th. Because on December the 5th of that same year, 63, this is when the 13th Amendment was now ratified and became official. So since it's now a, um, a constitutional law, then they said, now we're going to fall in line with it. So June the 19th is what we celebrated, but all the states really didn't fall in line until six months later. But that's why we have this thing called Juneteenth that comes about. But most folks will say, well, Juneteenth, I think slaves came free, which that's part of the story. But it's good to explain that whole entire history. Then the reason why I explain this all to you is I'm following the concept that we've always done here of how the children of Israel would do. Each and every celebration they would have, they would always explain it to the people that they could pass it on from generation to generation so they know why it is they're doing what it is that they were actually doing. Then all this basically leads us now to the lesson that we have today. Uh, as you know, we started um, this unit three weeks ago. This is unit three of four units that deals with the overall theme of uh, Christ proclaims the kingdom. Now, we talk about Christ proclaims the kingdom. We talked about how dealing with Christ, that his message always revolved around repentance and the kingdom was at hand. Because as we discussed, when John the Baptist came on the scene, he said what? Repent, for the kingdom is at hand. When John was arrested and put into prison, he said, I must decrease, he must increase. Jesus came forth and said, repent, for the kingdom is at hand. When he sent his apostles out two by two, they went forth and said, repent, for the kingdom is at hand. When the day of Pentecost came, Peter boldly stood after receiving the Holy Spirit. He said, repent, for the kingdom is at hand. When Paul finally had his conversion on the road to Damascus, and he went forth to preach. He said, repent, for the kingdom is at hand. But the big question is, what is his kingdom? This is why this first unit was entitled Understanding God's Kingdom. But to understand God's kingdom, our first lesson told us you have to look at it totally in a backward sense because that lesson was entitled The Upside Down Kingdom. You remember I called it the Backwards Kingdom. Uh, some would say that the secular world is totally reverse of what God does because you find that when you read the lesson, you have to always look at it that way, that God does it totally different than us. This is why we talked about Isaiah when he said that your ways are not my ways, neither are your thoughts my thoughts, for my thoughts are high above in the heavens. God does things in a total reverse order. Uh, you look at when he chooses someone, he could choose someone who's great, but who does he choose? Somebody who's always the least of anyone, and he would make that thing great time and time again. Even today, we're dealing with the choosing of his apostles. He could have chose the Pharisees, who were the most respected, educated people in the community who knew the scriptures. He could have chose the scribes, who was the transcribers, the editors of the law, who broke things down for the Pharisees so they could teach them in the synagogues. But who did he pick? Fishermen, tax collectors, tent makers, uh, shepherds, and so on from there to become some of the greatest individuals that we have ever seen because God does things totally different. This is why that lesson dealt with the Latin word of beatitudes, which means happy or well-being, when it says... Happy are the poor or blessed are the poor. Happy are those that mourn. Happy are those that persecute it. Because God does everything in total reverse from what we have done. It. But that dealt with what we call the um, Sermon on the Mount, which was chapter 5, 6, and 7. Today we move from that to move to the gospel according to Mark. Now to break things in, when we talk about the gospels, we say that all these lessons are dealing with the um, Three books which are known as the Synoptic Gospels. The Synoptic Gospels are Matthew, Mark, and that of Luke. They are called the Synoptic Gospels because they are so similar in style and context of writing. In other words, each one of them says the same thing, but they may say it differently. Each one of them might talk about the same story, but one might explain it in a way the other one didn't or add something the other one did not say. So whenever you're reading um, things of Jesus, you have to look at all the Gospels and tie them together to get the full understanding of what actually is going on. But each one presents him in a different way. We said Matthew presents him truly as that of the um, king. He's a, uh, the Messiah himself. And his audience is that of the nation of Israel. But today we're in Mark. And last week when we closed out, I asked this question, because we have been before, and see how good your memory is. I said, how does Mark present him? And who is Mark's audience? That was the very last thing we said last Sunday. Anybody remember that? Nobody remembers that? Mark 
is a book of action. Mark tells the same story as Matthew does, but Mark presents it in a different fashion. Mark presents him as a servant. In other words, one who does things, the things he has done for the people himself. And Mark's audience is actually mostly those of Rome, because the Romans don't know things about the Messiah and so forth. Now. So this is how Mark presents them. But in this lesson we have before us, we deal with Mark, the third chapter, the 13th verse, if anybody using the Bible. This deals with, of course, we won't get through too much of all any of this. Mark deals with Jesus now handpicking the individuals that will carry forth the ministry. But you'll find that what led to this was that, remember the story of Jesus healed the man with the withered hand, and they watched him to see whether he would do this on the Sabbath day. So they could find some way to accuse him that they may, as they say, destroy him. Otherwise, they wanted to kill Christ here. But after this incident took place, Christ leaves them and says these words. And he goeth up into a mountain and calleth unto him whom he would. And they came unto him. Now here Jesus goes unto a mountain. And when he goes to this mountain, he goes just to be away in a place of solitude to talk to the father because he's about to select his men. Jesus has a serious moment here now. He has to pick individuals that will carry on the ministry absent of him being here physically. So he goes to his father now to pray about these things. But this is what I mean by the synoptic gospels. You don't see that when you read this verse. It says, he goeth up into a mountain and calleth unto him whom he would, and they came unto him. To get the full understanding of this, you have to turn to Luke's gospel in the sixth chapter. Because Luke adds these words. He said, go up unto a mountain and he prayed to his father all night long. But he doesn't say he prayed to his father. But the point is, Christ went up on his mountain now to speak to his father, to pray that he may choose the right individuals to carry forth this ministry when he is gone. And another key thing I have to look at is this. When he says, here, and he called unto him whom he would, and they came unto him. Luke says it this way. If you look at the other gospels, there's a lot of people. He said, call unto him his disciples. And of them, he chose 12. What I'm explaining is this, that I can't really break everything down because we're running out of time. Jesus had disciples. And every we hear that term disciple, which is a student, a learner, or a follower, we think of the 12. But when you read the scripture, you have to always look, who is he talking to as far as disciples? Here is a multitude of people. I'm talking a massive crowd. Early in the scripture, it talks about how this giant multitude follows him from all over Galilee, Jordan, and Samaria, and so on from there. But he called these individuals to them, to him, and all this massive crowd, he picked out 12 individuals who would be his apostles. Now, the apostles are different from disciples. I always confuse people by saying this. I said, all apostles are disciples, but not all disciples are apostles. Because a disciple is just a student, a learner, or a follower. Whereas an apostle is considered an ambassador, an envoy, one who takes the message of Christ and carries it abroad and teaches others. So Christ now has elevated them from being a student, you could say, to being that of the teacher themselves. But now Christ has prayed to his father that he will have these men to go forth. It says in verse 14, that he ordained 12. So what did, what did Christ do? He prayed to God first. Let me show you how God's ways are not our ways. and does things, we would say, backwards. Jesus has a monumental task before him, right? He has to choose 12 individuals who will carry forth the gospel. And what does he do? He go up on a mountain, and he does what? He prays. Otherwise, he prays that these things will work out and work out right, and God will give him uh, these best men. Remember our re previous lesson talked about, he says, these men, he says, you gave me. I have not lost any. So he said, God had picked them out. Now, we run across a problem. What do we do? There you go, Jay. We jump right in, and we just do it. In other words, and sometimes we might do it this way. Like, for example, here, Jesus prays about it, and then action comes. We will put forth action and then pray that it works out right. In other words, we already put our plan. That's what, the, what Doc Hayes would say. You put the cart before the horse here. We'll go ahead and do something first. And Lord, I hope this work out. But yet you'll find that God's ways is not the first thing you do is you pray about it. And then you find then the action comes into place here. And these individuals will pick. Now, what qualifications do these people have that he picked? Are they any good? Why would he pick them? Hmm? One class getting a hard worker. In other words, what you're saying, you see something in these individuals, don't you? There's always something that everybody brings to the table. 
I always say it this way. God will call whosoever he will, but he won't just call anybody. He'll call you for a certain reason. Like you take Paul, for example. I think Paul today, if he would go to any church with an application to be a pastor, he would not get selected. Even though he wrote half of the New Testament. You know why? Paul was the one who said, I persecuted the Christians. I sought letters from the religious leaders to go in different regions around them up to have them arrested. I stood there and gave words against them while they were being executed. I had men, women, and children put into jail. And he says these things over and over and over, but we would say, no, we can't have Paul here. But what did God did? He picked Paul. Why? Paul had something in him. Paul was as he said, he did his work zealously for the Lord. So in other words, he had a passion for what he was doing. Even though he said later, I did it ignorantly, not knowing that I was doing things wrongly. Paul was a son of a Pharisee. He even said, I'm a Pharisee of Pharisees, to the point that Paul was so educated that his peers looked up to him for what he brought to the table. You'll find Moses was in the same situation. Moses was born, I said, with three strikes on his back. One, he was born into slavery. One, he was born a, he secondly born a Hebrew. And third, by being born a Hebrew child, he was sentenced to death. But yet God says, I can use this man. But what he said, he said, I can't speak. God said, don't worry, I'm going to put my words in your mouth. He became one of the greatest leaders that you would ever see. So in other words, he saw something in them, just like sometimes it takes others to see things in us that we don't see ourselves. I know, Mike, you've probably seen choir members. I can't sing. But then they sing this song, they're like, where has she been hiding this whole time? But they can't see to themselves. But when it comes to picking people for jobs, how do we pick people for jobs? It doesn't have to be the church. How do people get selected for jobs? What qualifications do they have? How does the world pick people? My way might be different than yours. Oh, who you know. Like that's good old saying what you said, not what you know, but who you know. But sometimes, son, does that mean they're qualified for it? Hmm. We just pick them because of, what's the word they use? Um... And nepotism, family members, people that you know, you, you handpick them for the job, even though they're not qualified for it. I tell you, one of the worst ones I've seen, um, and we talked about this before, what is the role of a godparent? Mm -hmm. That's the role of a godparent, right, folks? The role of a godparent is that, I mean, you can say it a different way, but let's say absent of the parents, you are there to raise this child as your own. Mm -hmm. I didn't say you raise them like they were your own. You raise them as your own. And typically, in the days of old, the way you would choose someone in that particular situation, you would say, I'm going to find a couple that I, you know, that you know. Let's say they had their own home. They're working, you know, they're respectful folks. They're going to give them the right values, the right characteristics, you know. They should be able to hopefully send them to higher education and so on from there. Because that's what you want in the event that something happens to that parent. But here we go. How do we pick them today? A godparent. How do we pick a godparent? Based upon who you know. I've seen people, I'm going to be critical, but guess what, guys? You can say, well, can you tell them the truth, though? I'm telling you the truth. I have been in situations where, uh, let's say they say, well, I picked so-and-so to be the godfather because that's my boy. You heard that? Because that's my boy. Now, mind you, he was your boy back in school. And you graduated back in 1972, but he's still in school mentally. You know, otherwise has not grown up. I have seen situations where in the church you'll have uh, the godparents come up and that child has more going on for themselves and a better future than the godparent has. But yet you pick this individual to raise your child in your absence. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they'll pick, let's say, this man to be the father here and this lady to be the godmother. One lives in Tennessee and one lives in California. So I guess if something happens, the children have to split up, you know, because they're separated. So in other words, we've gotten away from the right qualification of get someone who's together to raise the children. But that's how the world does things, totally different from the way God does them. 
So when you're picking someone for the job, you want to pick what? The right person, the right people. Christ does just that here by choosing these individuals. First, he goes to his father, what? In prayer, that he may pick the right ones for the job. And he says he ordained 12, which means he installed, he consecrated, he agreed with, he put in the office, he set aside for this particular purpose. He said that they should be with him and that he might send them forth to preach. First of all, they would be with him. Christ had an inner circle, didn't he? Of three that we call the inner circle um, of Peter, James, and John. But these 12 are really his inner circle because these are the ones he said, I want you to be with me. Because everywhere Christ went, there was massive crowds that followed him everywhere he went. But yet these 12 are the ones he wanted to be with him. And then he says, I'm going to send you forth to do what first? He said, preach. Why not? Why don't do miracles first? Why don't do things like that first? Many people in the crowd follow Christ, we said, for various reasons. Some followed him uh, because they needed healing. Some followed him because they believed he was a great teacher. Some followed him because they believed he was a prophet. Some followed him because they believed he was Messiah. Some followed him because everybody else was following him. Some followed him because they just wanted to be curious for whatever reason it may be. But you'll find here that many followed him because they wanted to hear that preach word. Here you'll find that we say, I'm sending forth to preach. It was not their message. It was his message that they were actually going to bring forth to the people at this time. Because when Christ gave his message, did Christ ever walk around and tell everybody he was the Messiah? You, you don't see nowhere in Scripture. I mean, of course, when they questioned him, he said, thou hast said so. What I'm getting at is that Christ never walked to, I am the Messiah, you know, the kingdom is at hand, follow me. All he did was preach. And he wanted you to believe and know in your heart that he was the Messiah. And therefore, you would truly follow him rather than just following someone who would say anything. Whereas others came forth, people would do miracles. Christ in the Bible, I say it this way, he didn't do any miracles. He gave you signs. Because you look at the scripture when Christ would speak, he said, I do this as a sign. Because what's the purpose of a sign? You go out there, you see a sign, what's the purpose of a sign? It shows you something. That says exit, which means you go out that way. You go to a restaurant, there's a name on the building, right? That sign lets you know what building it is. You go in somebody's office, their name is on the door as a sign. In other words, it's showing you the right way. So Christ, I do this as a sign. He did these so-called miracles to give them a sign that he was Messiah, but he never came out and said that I am Messiah unless you truly believed on him. And if I may read through just uh, maybe one or two real quick, he said also to have power to heal sickness and to cast out demons. And then it says, and Simon, he surnamed Peter and James, the son of, of Zebedee and so on. What he does there is, we don't have time to go through each individual, is he now gives their names and to understand their purpose and their character, you have to do some deep background. But you'll find, just to show you something in the Bible, is that you go to different writings of this, you'll see different names sometimes of some of the um, apostles. And people say, why did that one this name? Why is that one that name? Well, you'll find it also said his surname. Like Simon had three names. It was Simon, it was Peter, and it was Cephas. Peter and Cephas mean the same thing, which means the rock. But just to give you an idea, all they're speaking of is they have these surnames, which are known as nicknames. Do we have nicknames here? How many people had a nickname coming up? Raise your hand. Or oh, still have one. I see some of the hands like this. We all had nicknames coming up. I'm going to close out with, um, with my two nicknames. One I could deal with, one I wanted to stab him when, when he would call me that. When I was a kid coming up, I always wore glasses. And back then, you didn't have styles, Mike. You had one pair of black with the strap on the back because I would lose a pair every two months. When I was coming, I did a lot of, I used to do a lot of reading of books. So my uncles and stuff, they would call me the professor. You know, little small guys. That professor always reading the book. I didn't mind that name. The nickname that I hated was, some of you got to be old school remember this one. This, this was a cartoon character. Way back in the day, there was this little boy named Sherman who had this little white dog that wore glasses. And he's supposed to be a little smart little dog. And the dog name was Peabody. So they started calling me Peabody. I wanted to kill everybody who used that name. It stuck for a while, but I'm glad it finally went away. But what I'm getting at is when you see these uh, apostles' names, something they changed up, most of the time you'll find there they are surnames or they are so-called nicknames. But in this lesson that we really didn't get a chance to really cover it, it basically deals with Jesus going to his father in prayer, 
that he might make the right decision and have the right people for the right job to carry on his ministry. Because Jesus knew he had a short amount of time where physically he'd be walking among the people, and these individuals have to carry this message forth and get it right. This is why later he tells them, who does the world say that I am? And they said, some say Moses, some say Isaiah, some say Elijah, some say the great prophet has come. He said, but who do you say that I am? Then the purpose of him asking that is, you see right there, the world had all these different views of who he was. Just imagine if those disciples went out and everybody said something different. Where would the gospel be today? So this is why he wanted those 12 to, at first he said, to be with me, and that is to preach the message. Now that was the lesson we had for today, which was a, a rush hurry, hurried message, but nevertheless it was a good message. But next week we're closing out our first unit, which deals with um, growing God's kingdom, and that's going back to the gospel of Matthew, dealing with the 13th verse itself.